You're listening to Cotton Tales Podcast, part of the Silicon Valley Black Project, which produced the documentary film, A Place at the Table, about the black pioneers of Silicon Valley. A Place at the Table can be viewed for rent on Vimeo.com, on demand, backslash A Place at the Table stem. Through Cotton Tales Podcast, the Silicon Valley Black Project will continue to recognize the contributions made by African Americans. We will be featuring African American professionals, technologists in the fields of engineering, administration, and entrepreneurial pursuits from the past and present. We're talking to Clanita Justice, presently working as a program manager for Google. Her mathematical skills and interest in technology were nurtured and encouraged by her father and extended family, who were all versed in mathematics. Her interest in software engineering led her to the University of California, Berkeley, Howard University, Silicon Valley, Lucasfilm, and finally to Google. Um, so are you working on site or are you working from home for Google? I work from home. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a program manager. There's no need to be on site. How's that working yeah. for you, though? I like it. I think I'm more productive being at home because it's just me and my husband, mm-hmm. and he works nights. I have really no disturbances other than the ones I create for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so... <laughs> Um, so I'm definitely more productive at home than I, I think I was going, you know, spending time either commuting in my car or on the bus. Tell me about Clanita when she first decided that she was going to be in technology. So actually, when I started college, um, technology was not where I started. I started out in business. Okay. So my uncle worked for IBM. He was a systems administrator at IBM, and um, and so he told me to go in business, and so I did at the University of Denver. My first semester was um, business computing, and I loved it, mm-hmm. and I'm one of those people that when I really like something, that I want to be as good as I possibly can, and so I knew I was hooked when I was, like, going to the professor's office hours and asking why I got one problem wrong on the pop quiz. <laughs> like, I got nine out of ten, but I wanted to know why, you know, what I did wrong in that one problem that I got wrong. Thought process is, was that I didn't want to go to school and learn to read and write. I thought I already knew how to read and write. And so computer science was so new um, to me, and, and it wasn't very, it wasn't necessarily very popular at the time. Um, so it was something worth paying for. That's how I decided on technology. But the other thing I, in, in retrospect, um, my dad who majored in poli sci and got his degree from Cal state LA and then went on to law school. He was a natural, he's a natural, um, spatial designer. So he'll, you know, without thinking much about it, he'll design, you know, do architects, he'll, map out a room he'll you know he he taught me how to use a slide rule um he bought one of the early calculators he bought a digital watch in the late 60s early 70s math primarily and engineering were always in my space um growing up and then my uncle who worked for IBM system administrator I also have um his older brother he worked for Northrop as a computer programmer in fact, he was the first black com- computer programmer at Northrop. Looking back, I was being nurtured. You know, I was always surrounded by technology in some form or fashion. Mm-hmm. And, and that was nurturing that problem-solving mindset. Mm-hmm. When I decided it, as a freshman that computer science would be my major, some aspect of it that felt natural. It did not intimidate me or strike me that I was the only one. In my upper senior junior, senior, that maybe um, being by myself, you know, not having anybody that looked like me as a role model um, became sort of um, something that I was aware of. Mm-hmm. Toward the end of my first year at University of Denver, I, um, I 
I wanted to study computer science as it related to business and not just the theory of computer science. And that was difficult to find. I started looking for programs that were like business and computer science. And I found a couple, but I didn't get financial support when I applied to those schools. Mm -hmm. So I kind of came home from my first year not having a plan of like what I was going to do. I didn't want to go back to Denver. They weren't going to allow me to do business and computer science. Um, And then I also was really homesick. I um, ultimately decided that that I would go to Berkeley um, and I gave in to not having uh, computer science and business hand in hand because at Berkeley, I had the same issue. Those two schools are very separate. Mm -hmm. So I decided to do computer science at Cal. The interesting thing about Cal is they had two versions of the CS program at Cal. And the only difference between the two programs was, one, the general um, courses were humanity-based, and the other, the general courses were um, engineering-based. So, Mm. you know, in engineering, you have to take physics and chemistry. And when I went to letter science, I took philosophy and geology. And it it was a challenge. I was smart. There was a lot of family and emotional baggage that I carried while I was in college. And so the emotional things outside of school that I had to do or deal with affected my schooling. I actually failed out of Cal. And I had mental illness and didn't realize it. Um, Later in my, as an adult, I was diagnosed as a chronic depressive Mm. um, or I experienced chronic depression. So in looking back, I'm like, oh, yeah, I was very depressed. Uh, (laughs) So, um, and I had a lot of self-esteem issues. And I think, you know, looking back, I probably could map that to one being the only. Mm -hmm. Um, Because a lot of times, you know, I was in, it'd be 250 people in an auditorium and I'd be the only black person. And, And that was it. I really liked the study of computer science, like I never lost that. Um, And that's the only thing that kept me going, Mm. Um, that passion for understanding how the technology worked. So I I always had motivation and I was very resilient. So um, when I failed out, um, I actually did a couple of things. One, um, I went and got an internship in Silicon Valley to prove that I had the chops in the field to myself and to others. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing I did was um, I took extension courses. So you, as many people know, UC Berkeley has a program, UCB Extension. I got the opportunity to take a couple of the courses that I had failed as an extension course. I think one of them was compilers and the other one was operating systems. And then I worked full time. And on my, um, in Silicon Valley, while I took these courses part-time, I was able to get back in to Berkeley. I met a mentor that really helped me understand computer theory. So he was a graduate student. I was, when I was working in the Valley, he actually drove me to, um, to, to Berkeley on the day that I had my interview with, um, with the department to get back in to school. I had a meeting with the College of Letters and Science counselor, and he accused me of wanting to major in computer science for the money. This is not, you know, 1999 or 2000, 2001, where, you know, we're having this boom mm-hmm. in technology, in, you know, in computer science and, and Silicon Valley and technology in general. This is, you know, 1985, 86, I don't, no. I didn't even know there was money, in, right? I didn't even know there was money right. in it. Uh, so <laughs> I, you know, I remember, you know, he, he got so incensed, he started yelling at me, um, this white guy. And I ran out of that, I ran out of there crying because I was, I felt so unseen. Um, like my uncles were supportive. My dad was off and on. Um, he just wanted to make sure that I was well and happy. Um, and so when it got hard, um, he was like, oh, no, just don't do that. And I'm like, but no, that's what I want to do. <laughs> and so there was a semester he convinced me to major in philosophy. 
because it would be easier for me. And I did. And then I, you know, came back to myself and said, no, this is not where I'm going. It's not what I want to do. So I felt like in a lot of ways, on multiple faces, I was the unicorn. And I was like really like rebelling against, you know, normalcy. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was really hard. Um, And my dad had a hard, I think my, also my dad had a hard time seeing me go through the similar things that he went through, but then not acquiescing to the the pressures caused him some moments of being uncomfortable. Like, how can I support my daughter when, when I think she's going down a path where she won't be supported in it and, and it's going to be a hard road mm-hmm. to go down, um, you know, as a black woman. He often tried to convince me not to finish my major in computer science and department. So they decided that I had done enough to get back into school, but I was still a non-major. And so I still had to continue to take my major courses, not being a computer science major. Um, So I did, and I did okay. I was very involved with the Berkeley Engineering Student Science Association. That group became sort of my my support system. Mm -hmm. I stayed taking courses and but the family and life issues did never never went away mm-hmm. like tests and especially finals were not my my words I was not well suited for them at the time um, and I didn't know you know I was so caught up into push 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 forward and you know mm-hmm. do what I'm being asked to do that I I didn't step back and and look at my mental health and support myself in a way where um, I had good mental health and coping skills in order to get through school. So I just kind of, I was always on thin ice. (laughs) Like I got to my final semester, finished my classes, and I actually had to have another meeting with the chair of the CS department to convince them to let me get a degree in computer science. I went through the um, application process to get into CS, and they didn't. And they denied me. They rejected me. I went through a pill process. They rejected me. And so I was at my wits' end. And I remember I was at my job in Silicon Valley. I had a summer internship. And I have to say, my jobs were my were gave me that validation mm-hmm. that I could do the work. And so I always got really great, you know, glowing recommendations from managers that I worked with. And um, and I loved the work that I was doing. I had a resume mm-hmm. with like probably a year and a quarter of work experience in Silicon Valley, which was not common for other, you know, computer science majors. Right. That was unique. And I had, I had two job offers um, <laughs> when they had the graduation uh, ceremony. I was asked to speak. What? 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 <laughs> so they decided instead of, I don't know if they didn't have, a valedictorian, <laughs> or because you were- <laughs> I have to say, I, the other thing that I think is, is probably worth noting is that um, when I was at Cal, the program went through a transition. So, like the actual structure of the program was, ch- was dramatically changed, such that I had to go back and retake two CS courses um, because it, there was um, it was burgeoning object-oriented programming, which is very common now. It did not exist at the time that I was at Cal, but pe- but you know the, the smart minds were thinking about it, and so um, they wanted to shift from you know Pascal and Fortran mm. to C. Yeah, I never forget that course was like a huge class because all of us had to retake it. Right, and and the first midterm majority of people felt they couldn't even do a curve. The second midterm majority of people didn't do well. So basically, by the time you got to the final, your grade was based on your final grade that you got in the course, because they didn't know how to teach what they were teaching. And somebody from the industry had come to teach the course. So they weren't, you know, well versed in, you know, academics. Mm-hmm. It was, it was a mess, but <laughs> we got through it. I just was happy to get out of Cal when I got out of Cal. And, and Somebody said, well, do you want to grad- go to grad school? I was like, no, I don't want to go to grad school. I just want to just, like, take a breath. Um, and and the other interesting thing that happened, because I had this all this work experience, I actually 
I was told by the counselor, but I got the highest job offer, highest salary um, of anybody in the in my class um, for job offers. And so I ended up, uh, and I had two companies competing for me. Um, and one of my cousins was like, you're like a football player. Because, you know, this is before, you know, we had mobile phones and stuff, right? So I had uh, the recruiters from the different companies calling me during Christmas vacation at my cousin's house in LA. So, so that was really cool and stuff. But I ended up, um, one was in Chicago, one was in the Silicon Valley, and decided to stay in California um, because that's, I know California. Right. And so I ended up taking a, val- a job in the Valley at a company called Tandem, which doesn't oh, exist yeah. anymore. But um, HP was a big competitor of theirs. And Tandem eventually got bought by Compaq, and Compaq eventually got bought by HP. Is that um, when I was at Tandem, I met a lot of older black technologists, and I remember one in particular. She was she was uh, from Mississippi. Mm-hmm. She got her math degree, and I can't remember her name, but she was so um, supportive. Mm-hmm. I mean, she worked for HP, but Tandem was right next to HP, right. like, and so HP was considered like you know old old Silicon Valley. And Tandem was new Silicon Valley. Yes. So its focus was online transaction processing. Um, it was called Tandem because they ran two processors to, uh, simultaneously. So mm-hmm. one would be the backup for the other. So it was fault-tolerant processing. Yeah. I did thrive at Tandem for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, I was there, I think, five years. But it wasn't until my last year at Tandem that um, I ran into um, very overt um, racism. I ended up taking a contract position at Apple because the other thing that I was doing is that um, when I got out of school, um, I really started pursuing my love of dance. While I worked at Tandem, I um, taught hip hop courses, so fit hip hop courses and fitness clubs. And then I was on a Nike sponsored um, hip hop dance troupe um, called Culture Shop. And I had started doing um, commercial acting on the side as well. When I took the job at Apple, I took it so that I could do my dancing and my acting and um, and, and be a programmer. The deal was is that I took the contract and anytime I needed to take the day off, I'll, I just had to give them 24 hours notice, um, which worked out really well because most of the time I didn't know until the day before whether I had gotten a job or not. <laughs> So it was it was it was definitely a life of many hats and that um, and it was great but it was also exhausting um, and I decided at some point that I needed to combine my my love of the arts with my technology logical problem solving brain I would go to the Apple Library and start reading up on multimedia and because I have a love of movies and narratives and storytelling um I really started getting involved in that and then I decided to take a class with UB UCB extension on Java programming for multimedia and then I started telling people that this was my new interest and I was thinking of like you know shifting my career slightly to move into that space Mm -hmm. One Monday, a friend of mine sent me an email saying that Howard University was standing up a multimedia um, applications um, department um, or lab, Mm -hmm. and they were looking for graduate students. And so I contacted Howard, and they're like, well, send us your resume. So I faxed them my resume, and, and they're like, oh, we would love for you to apply. I always in this period of my life, I always say God was working overtime <laughs> because um, I sent my resume on a Monday. Tuesday, I officially applied. By Friday, they had accepted my application, so I have been accepted to Howard University with a scholarship, um, a full a full scholarship. That Friday evening, um, friends of mine that. Um, I wouldn't. They were like, oh, I was called the Temple of the News. They're like, oh, you need to come over and meet um, my aunt who's in town from D.C. And so I go over to meet her, and she has an empty apartment in D.C. because she's staying with her daughter, wherever her daughter lives, <laughs> and wanted to know if I wanted to, you know, sublet it 
from her. Um, and so I had a full scholarship and a place to live. <laughs> um, so all I had to do was get myself there in a month. So I uh, packed up my life and uh, moved to DC to go to Howard um, to study multimedia applications get to Howard and Howard's a different beast. Like Howard is a small um, black college in uh, DC, which is south of Mason Dixon line, which I didn't know until I got there. <laughs> and I'm this California chick, you know, who went to a large predominantly white college um, as the only, um, worked in Silicon Valley for seven years as one of, only. Um, and so I had a, tr a tough transition yeah. um, because um, the culture was different. You know, it was East Coast, West Coast. It was large, you know, college to small college. And, and it was, it was DC, yeah. <laughs> which has its own uniqueness. And I loved DC, um, but it took me a while to get comfortable. Yeah. In DC, you know, they brought me there and they wanted me to chair a what they called an internet conference, like the first month, and and they expected all the all the speakers and they expected that I would have contacts and I would bring all these speakers in and you know because I was from Silicon Valley, which was like you know this utopia of bastion of technology and. <laughs> And so I was just, I was in shock because I'm like this only child. I'm still this introvert and only child. Um, and the only thing I, the one thing that I did that was really smart is that I knew that I wanted to do my graduate degree different than I did my college degree. So the first thing that I did was go to uh, health services at Howard and find a therapist. <laughs> say, say, you're going to be my friend for the next few years while I figure out how to get through this school. Um, but it was, it was really rough. Um, I, I ended up, um, I did well, but I often had professors telling me that I acted like they worked for me, but then I worked for them. So I was not a subservient student. Um, I still had the, I still had the mentality that I was paying for an education, even though it wasn't, I was on scholarship <laughs> and that, you know, I was, a, should be afforded certain services <laughs> that, you know, we're not, we're a counter to how uh, Howard thought of themselves in the hierarchy that exists sometimes um, in small institutions. Um, but I had, I got a really good friend and she was an electrical engineer, graduate school. And so she became my, you know, ride or die. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I got through, I got through Howard. Um, I did much better at Howard than I did at, um, at Berkeley, I had 4.0 at Howard, thank God. I um, I said, I gotta go back to California. I need a break, you know, I need to get back to my comfort zone. I was doing a project for the department chair of CS. Um, I was developing an online um, tutorial um, to do like basic CS education for him mm -hmm. using Macromedia Director. The NSB conference is gonna be in Anaheim and I'm like, Cool. And for those of you that don't know SB is it's National Society of Black Engineers. He said, well, if you can do it for $800, I just got an $800 grant. If you can do it for $800, here you go. And I'm like, yeah, I can get back to California. And I knew if I got to California, then I had a higher probability of getting an internship in California. And so I went to uh, the NSB conference. Um, this is God working again. Um, with my resume and my, I had what one would call their abstract for my dissertation that I was playing around with that I wanted to do my dissertation on. Um, but I went up to Silicon Graphics and SGI for short. And, uh, and I happened to talk to this guy who loved my pitch. And he's like, you know what? I know the perfect team for you. They were not intending on taking an intern this summer. So, you know, it's a long shot, but Basically, I'm going to route your resume to this team. It's, you know, going to be, you know, a tight timeline for me to make this happen. And I'm like, okay. So, of course, all that happened. And I thought I literally bombed the interview. Like, because I, I bombed with one particular person. 
Um, and so I'm like, I'm not going to get that job. And the guy that I bombed with called and offered me the job, and he knew what he had done. And he's like, I bet you thought you weren't going to get the job. And I was like, yeah, I always do the interview where I ask questions that I know people don't know the answer to um, just to see how they handle it. But that's no indication that you're, you know, you're, you're great. <laughs> the job at um, SGI was with this team that built Studio Central, which was a database um, for multimedia applications. And so the idea is that Studio Central was a database for media. Their biggest contract and client was Lucasfilm. And I did a summer project as a thank you. I got a tour of Lucasfilm. So I got to go to Lucasfilm for the day, meet with the liaison between SGI and Studio Central that worked on the branch at Lucasfilm, was introduced to the software engineering manager for the team that was using Studio Central. I go back to Howard. I continue doing my coursework. The, my last semester... I think it was January, January of 97, I am uh, getting ready to start my dissertation and I get a call from Lucasfilm saying, hey, we have a software engineering position open, we want to know if you're interested in it. So by February, I had the job. From February to April, I wrote my dissertation. I defended it and, um, and then I defended it on a Friday and on a Sunday, I got on a plane and flew to back home and uh, started my job at Lucasfilm, working on a multimedia data asset management system um, for episodes one, two, and three. My area of expertise was metadata. The other engineer was media. We had a great time. We came up with the holistic perception of we needed to be at every point of the film production process. But if we're really effective, we don't have to wait till the end. We can actually start with conceptual art Lucasfilm was its own universe, right? And not Lucasfilm, but Star Wars was its own universe. And so all of this content at different stages was used in some way. Conceptual art books that were put together. It was in um, their publishing division where they were, you know, expanding the universe, telling all these stories by having writers write books. And so there was reference material for that. It was like magazine articles. It was museums. Um, so I worked on the ranch and then I worked on the second ranch. He built a second ranch. I worked there. Experience. I was there for seven years. I did meet him a couple times. Oh, full circle. When I was uh, dancing with Culture Shock, George Lucas's oldest daughter, Amanda, was on the dance troupe um, in the youth group. She had a Christmas party at his home. I went to the wrong house. It was in the guest house. So I went to the house. George Lucas answered the door. He walked me down to the guest house. And the whole time this is happening in my head, I'm like, I could work for him. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks I'm just a dancer, but I could work for him. <laughs> and then, guy. you know. In a full circle. <laughs> full circle. I'm working for George Lucas. It seems and like you've been getting messages from God all along the way. He just kept sending you little packages God was, yes. Or was fate amazing. or whoever. <laughs> yeah, God, universe, fate, coincidence, serendipity, yeah. all of those things. I believe in God, so I always like, God has just got my back. <laughs> but you know, the, yeah. other, the other piece of that is that you kept working and gaining more and more knowledge so that when that opportunity mm -hmm. came, you know, you yeah, had something to offer. You know, it's funny because I look back on that conversation with the um, letters and science counselor saying that I wanted to do it for the money. And I didn't. Some level of money eventually came. But Clanita, um, what is wrong with doing it for the money? Well, that's what I was going to say is that um, it never, it doesn't seem like a negative anymore. Money is a motivator for me. Yeah. It took me a while to be okay with that. It took me a while to ask for more. Mm -hmm. When I got my job at Lucasfilm, mm -hmm. um, they wanted to know what my base salary was the last time I was working. And, um, and I remember not wanting to tell them because I didn't know what I didn't know. It was $30,000 more the last job I had um, before grad school. So basically going to grad school, you know, boosted my salary by 30000 It's easier to do research to know what the base salary is, right? Um, I recommend you do your, you do your homework and yes. find out what the what the going salary rate is, you know, for somebody with skill set and, um, and experience, um, to set your, you know, 
what you want your salary to be. Not only was I the only black woman in the room, but I was often, you know, one of two or three females yeah. in the room. Like this was 1984 to 1989 when I was at Cal. Mm-hmm. There were, I mean, not only was it a very small like group of people that were majoring in computer science during that time, it was predominantly white male. Right. So yeah, mm-hmm. you were you were a rare fish to begin with. I was okay. Yes. Exactly. A male or female, and then mm-hmm. to be a black female, that made you even more unique. So yeah. Yeah, so obviously you were there for the money. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> you, know, no you, you know, all this nonsense you have to put up with for the money. <laughs> mm-hmm. It had You had yeah. to love what you were doing in order to put up with what you had to put up. But, uh, yeah, I had to, yeah, that's the, that's the, that was my saving grace is that I really loved what I was doing. And I still do to today. Lucasfilm went through a major reorg. So I worked for Lucasfilm proper, which was the small company that did one film at a time. Mm-hmm. And so what was really great about this film is that we got royalties from every film. So if you were on episodes one, two, and three, you got royalties from each of those films as they were produced and went out into the public. George Lucas was awesome. He was really a huge about profit sharing. Wonderful. The CFO became the president of Lucasfilm at the time because they had a software engineering team at Lucas at ILM, and so they merged us, and um, and I was not happy. <laughs> I was no longer happy anymore, um, and so it was time for another change because I was coming out of my shell of being an introvert and wanting to engage with people and have conversations around requirements and analysis. I really liked that part of my job, and so. I started studying um, program management um, on the side. Project Management Institute was the certification that seemed to be the most well-known in the industry. Got my certification in um, from PMI. I got, became a program management professional. And then Lucasfilm laid me off. I left Lucasfilm with this PMP. I got a job at Apple as a creative, and I did that for about four months. Full circle, I come back home and... I get a contract at Apple as a PGM for Final Cut Pro. I almost took a job, a full-time job at Apple, but they had a hiring freeze. So I ended up leaving Apple, went to Sony Ericsson for a year, worked on mobile apps as a program manager. And then, um, and then Google called Mm. and um, I ended up having this two hour conversation with a recruiter, just exploratory about the things that I was interested in. Recruiter kind of warned me that, Google interviews can be kind of challenging and you have to study for them. And so, and again, God, I walk into this interview and basically they asked me the questions of the things that I'd studied. <laughs> Perfect. And I, and I, that was like the one interview experience that I can say was like the most fun <laughs> that I had in an interview ever. It was awesome. I didn't go to that interview like wanting the job. I was just, cause I wasn't, this, at this point, I had a job. I wasn't losing a job. Wanted to ask uh, ask you, uh, now that you're settled, you're in Google, are you planning on staying here for a while? Or do you have plans to start your own organizations? What are you thinking? So, uh, so right now, um, I am staying at Google. Mm-hmm. There's nothing compelling me to, to like say it was time to make a move. Yeah. Where I am now is, I'm, I like it. Um, I do miss the work that I did on stories and media right now. I'm focused on user-centric development and helping developers do their product development from um, a more user-centric perspective and so that we meet the needs of the users more effectively. Sometimes I think about like doing my you know, media stuff on the side, mm-hmm. um, but I just haven't found the bandwidth. Mm-hmm. Um, Taking care of my two parents is uh, is a huge responsibility. Were you raised in Silicon Valley area or were you raised in Southern California? So I was raised in Southern California up until um, high school. And I, I went to high school in Oakland. I see. Okay. Yeah, I went to high school in Oakland. So, um, so I call myself a California girl through and through. If you could look back in your first year of college, if you could look back then and you could see yourself, what would you tell yourself? So when I was in college, I used to always go, I just want to know everything's going to be all right. And so I would probably tell myself, everything's going to be all right. You're good. 
um, is going to be hard, um, but you have incredible resilience. You may not always be fully aware of your passion for the work that you're doing, but it comes from a true place, a real place inside of you. Um, and so that's going to sustain you and you're going to be okay. And I think you would have, uh, you would have enjoyed hearing that. <laughs> he would have said, Oh, great. <laughs> I was like, thank you. Yeah. Could you, could you just come back and keep telling me yeah, that? Please. Can you show up next week at the same time? <laughs> right. You know, I just need to hear it over and over and over yeah. again. Yeah. I listened to your path and it was it was quite that's quite a journey. Yeah, it's funny. I was like, Well, it's not average. No. And but it's not there's no like grand gesture, you know, at the end yeah. that, you know, like, oh, and she like started her own company and like, you know, it's just the very unique and miraculous road of navigating college and Silicon Valley and just maintaining. Yeah. Like, you know, and I, I like to use the word staying relevant. Yes. And, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hearing words like relevance and also sustainability. And uh, mm -hmm. what were the revelations that came to you on your path? What were some of the things that you could say there were these aha moments for you? And how would you describe it? Oh my God, there were so many. Mm. Because um, computer science requires you to be a constant learner. Mm -hmm. Like what I learned at Berkeley, practically, mm -hmm. is not anything that I can apply to today. Um, so I shouldn't say practically. What I the, the technology yeah. and the that I learned at Berkeley doesn't apply today. But I would say the concepts of computer science and computers and programming have not changed mm -hmm. like those are constant and those were embedded in me um at Berkeley from the start and those have carried me through um my career and first of all probably is that I have the right foundation okay to do this work and stay relevant in this work relying on that foundation of um understanding the basic constructs of computer languages and the basic constructs of problem solving and algorithms um, is something that I, you know, carry through as I learn new languages mm -hmm. um, throughout my career. And now even as a program manager, um, when I worked directly with engineering teams, I was one of those PGMs that they didn't have any problems sending into the room mm -hmm. to have a conversation with the engineers because I wasn't afraid of talking to the engineers. And, and I didn't even realize that that, that was a, um, a value or a skill set because um, I took it for granted. And so that was probably you know, one of my latest ahas, but when I was doing my storytelling system, that was an aha moment. Like when I started studying multimedia applications, I picked up a book on narratives and then I found a book on how you could um, use an algorithm to tell a story. The aha was, is that, um, and I had, and I told you I had some correspondence with MIT Media Lab. They gave me the resource of a an AI algorithm, sorry, mm -hmm. teach a robot um, instructions mm -hmm. through natural selection based on learning, a learning algorithm. And so I took that algorithm and rewrote it in Java to tell a story. What made it unique is that the stories were random. So you had a story space of um, information each piece of information was cataloged. Mm -hmm. And so the system would go through and find the next logical step or story or sentence that would follow um, the previous one to create a story. And so at the end, I did a bunch of analysis on um, whether it was a good story or not a good story. You know, like, you know, here's the graph of that story. You know, here's where the computer made this decision versus another decision. And um, it was fun. Um, and so that was an aha that, you know, one could program a computer to tell a story. Like we, that, that was something that was possible and, and interesting. Because mm. um, my aha sort of correspond to my transitions, mm. I think. You know, that my software engineering background had some valid use as a program manager. Um, to help engineers um, more effectively execute on against their projects. Well, there's two questions I have for you. One mm -hmm. is, what advice do you have for me as a storyteller? 
you know, a story has a beginning, middle, and end. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes in documentaries, mm -hmm. having the climax is sometimes a challenge. Like, you can do a documentary and never have, you can have a beginning, middle, and end, but never really have sort of yeah. these climactic moments yeah. of whether the, you know, protagonist or the, you know, focus has to make a critical decision. I think my own personal opinion is that those are the documentaries that are probably more interesting to me mm -hmm. um, when they create a journey for a particular like famous character or even a moment um, mm -hmm. where they really hone in on all the different aspects that were coming into play up until this climactic moment mm -hmm. that shifted everything like the autobiography of Malcolm X I it's one of my favorite books because he had these moments of like he had to reinvent himself mm -hmm. and and there were all these different aspects coming into play at any given moment where he had to you know go within himself and make a decision when he was a kid and his teacher told him he couldn't be a lawyer and then at some point that coming back to him and going no she wasn't right <laughs> you know this is what I've accomplished as a thug. This is what I'm learning while I'm in prison, you know, about my, my value and my power that's building up my self-esteem. And now this is the value that I can have going out into the world. And what was so interesting about Malcolm X is that he never forgot that he was a humble servant, that he was in service to something greater than himself. He has a powerful story of... Um, transformation and self-actualization one that's good for the ages those are the things that make good stories so even in um in our world of tech and blacks and in, in tech um i think all of us have those moments where we had to reinvent ourselves and 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 go and do some self-actualization because there's nobody that was like rolling out the carpet for us and saying hey come along <laughs> Especially in the early days, right? They weren't yeah. they weren't doing that. And so a lot of the you know, a lot of our motivation, a lot of our resilience, a lot of our staying our sustainability came from our ability to our, of self awareness self awareness and yeah. what mattered to us. Yes. Particularly black women, mm -hmm. I'm sure. What interested me was your transition from California to the East Coast. The East Coast. <laughs> I didn't stay. <laughs> What was the hardest part of that? What What would you say was the hardest part of that? And you know what? The hardest part, I think, so I, I have a hard time with disappointing people. I have a hard time with conflict. And I felt like what they were expecting from this black woman from Silicon Valley isn't exactly what they were getting. And so there was a level of disappointment that they had. Because um, I was just going there as a student, going there to learn. I hadn't considered that there was a value proposition for them accepting me beyond she would be a really good student, yeah. right? There was this concept of like, oh, she's coming from Silicon Valley. And, you know, if we give her this, then we should get this. <laughs> yeah, she'll bring <laughs> right? Steve Jobs to the campus, right? Got yeah, I, I, you know, I bring connections, I bring yeah. jobs, I bring, you know, insight. And, um, and so there is this constant sense of me not living up to the expectations that they had of me, especially, you know, being in a, in a black community that, you know, you want to give back and you want to meet people's expectations. And, and so it took me some time to um, at least figure out, you know, how I could provide value. Yeah. And also it took me a while to provide value and it took me a while to, um, to be okay yeah. with what I was good at and what I was not good at. Like I was always about, being unseen yeah. like I was good being the backup I was good you know so there was a part of me that was good with um being the only black person in the room because like invisible man they don't see you yeah. <laughs> like but you're right like they don't see you no and so you know but when you're black in a black community and you you know are studying pure science and you're a black female that you're very much seen right and it's like how great are you and it's like I don't think I'm that great. Um, so there was this transition that happened where I stepped into a broader understanding of me and my value and 
and I started seeing me, you know, um, through the eyes and lenses of other people. That was the beginning of me coming out of my shell as an introvert and, you know, and being a little bit more conscientious. Cause, and that was a lot of the work that I did with the therapist. So it was really good to have the therapist because um, I was trying to hide. And, uh, and she's like, no, I don't think you're supposed to be hiding right now. <laughs> Come on. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was one of the other things that came yeah. out of my experience at Howard. And, and so I look back and I, and I really value my experience at Howard. The academic was solid. Um, but beyond that, it was doing things that gave back, which is how I ended up doing the tutorial, um, the online tutorial for the department chair. And um, I TA'd some courses mm-hmm. and and into another course. I took the lead and helped teach the group Java. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, because... It was something that, it was a grad school program, and so we had to, like, teach ourselves certain things. And so I taught myself Java, and then I taught other people Java. And, um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, my dear, I really appreciate your time with you. But it was yeah. a pleasure to talk to you. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Nice to you, Kathy. Have a nice day. Nice for you, too. Thank you, Clanita, for a candid look at your journey. Your desire to be a computer scientist never faltered as you made your way through the maze of Silicon Valley's early days. Your story of being a first and how you weathered those challenges will help someone else along the way. Lastly, being so forthcoming about seeking a therapist for your mental health and anxiety issues, yet holding on to your love of technology, is a portrait of strength and forbearance. Thank you for sharing your life with us, and thank you for listening.